I run a left-wing blog called Liberal Conspiracy, which is a, a pretty big uh, left-wing blog. Uh, and I run another one, which I've stopped updating as much, called Pickle Politics. Um, so I use Twitter a lot um, and Facebook to um, tweet my ideas and stuff like that. Um, just a bit about the blog. So Liberal Conspiracy is just exclusively a left-wing uh, politics blog. We don't cover, um, you know, random stuff. Um, however, it is quite broad. So, I mean, Paul was saying earlier that it's difficult to have a, a blog which is uh, very broad. That's true. However, it's not impossible, but you do have to spend a lot of time on it. And you do have to focus a lot on uh, gathering news, trying to cover the subject big, uh, widely enough, as well as um, trying to have an ethos around it. I mean, one of the things that we try and do is try and say, what, what is the point of liberal conspiracy? What, what, what is the aim of the blog? And I think that it's always useful to say, um, you know, what, what is the ethos of the blog? And I, and I used to write for another blog years ago called The Sharpener, and it was kind of quite mixed. We had, it was a political blog, and it was like, you know, libertarians to like, quite centrists, one or two people on the right and that kind of stuff. But it was just broad, anyone could write about anything. Whereas we focus explicitly, I mean, I focus explicitly on saying this is a blog uh, about the left, uh, for the left, to try and make the left stronger, uh, you know, in, in, in UK politics. So it's very much, uh, it's got a political agenda. There's certain things that we decide we might not publish. For example, if it's attacking other people on the left, I might decide, no, that's too much infighting, that sort of stuff. So um, it has a specific political agenda. We don't allow, for example, oh, so I don't invite right-wingers to write for it, for example. So, um, uh, you know, but, I mean, not, not because I dislike them. Uh, well, sometimes I do, but broadly because they write for other websites. That's, it's just, so it's a space specifically for the lefties. Um, so I think it helps to have a, a sort of a broad ethos as to what you what you want your blog to be about, whether it's if, if it's the environment, if it's uh, knitting, uh, crafts, whatever. It's, it's a whole range of stuff, but it's worthwhile, I think, sometimes just saying, um, you know, this is what I intend to do with the blog. If you want to be fairly successful with it, I think. Yes, um, I actually had. Well, with it, 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 it's lucky. Sometimes, if you know some people, they'll send it to you and they'll put an embargo on it. So in this case, they actually the academic had actually uh, not the academic, the, the person from the university had actually sent me the letter and said we're going to publish this tomorrow. I'm assuming just because they know of the blog and they know that we publish a lot of stuff on the NHS. Um, sometimes it's not the case, but um, in this case. Yeah, they said, that, you know, this is going to be published tomorrow. So I actually had to sit on it. And I had a debate with someone from The Guardian on whether I should be publishing this ahead of time. And they said, do you really care about embargoes? And I said, generally, I dislike them if it's not a, an amazing story. But if, if someone's giving you a good story and they're saying, look, we want to make some noise with this, and that would help if it came out in the Telegraph tomorrow and then it's a big front page story. Um, then you have to kind of, I think, respect the embargo, even if you are a blogger and even if you're sitting on a good story. But a lot of times you just get sort of really lame stuff and they're like, you know, putting an embargo on it. And I just generally ignore that. Um, and if they don't like it, then that's their problem. I think it does... Uh, it, the, the thing is that the line is being blurred because a lot of... Uh, Obviously, mainstream media outlets have uh, blogs too. Um, and what we try and do, what I try and do is I have an opinion section and I have a news section. I try and keep the, keep uh, sort of a semblance of difference between them so people understand that that's news, that's opinion. Generally, it doesn't really work out, but you know, you try and keep that because you want to say one is purely just uh, out there for opinion and there's a lot of opinion out there. Otherwise, um, anyone can publish. I mean, you know, there's a lot of opinion out there. This is the other thing about blogging. So it's difficult to, I think, build a massive blog just because you think you've got lots of opinion, unless you've got something really unique to say and you come from a unique perspective and you, you, you're putting out analysis or whatever it is which people are not getting anywhere else. That's rare. Um, it's a crowded sort of market, if you want to call it that. So 
we try and focus on news a lot more and that sometimes means putting up videos I mean you know some of the biggest hits we get are you know stuff like um, daily show clips from the US and just put them on and say you know check out the the daily show coverage of the phone hacking scandal for example um, so it's a mixture of stuff it's sometimes we've done news for example we found out from a, 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 a um, a BBC, I got in, uh, contacted by a BBC journalist saying that they had been explicitly told in editorial meetings that they have to try and refer to cuts, which are government cuts, as savings instead because the ministers were putting pressure on them to say don't call them cuts, call them savings. And and so we blogged about it and, and it became a really uh, widely read story, lots of people retweeted it and interestingly enough the Labour Party then picked up on the story and then complained to um, uh, the BBC and said, you know, this, this should not be policy, you call a cut a cut, you know, you're not going to save two libraries. Um, um, so uh, I think that news journalism is, news blogging is very important and sometimes I slip in a bit of comment, you know, to it, but I generally try and stick to this is purely news or this is just a bit of information. Um, to see what's driving the, the uh, you know, to try and fit in with what the big stories are of the day or anything else that we want to focus on. Um, I'm trying to think of any big stories. But yeah, I mean, it, it's, I, I think you have to have a bit of news blogging as well to try and, if you're covering a broad range of areas, to try and say this is also what's going on somewhere else. So people can also comment on that even if you've got no opinion on that issue. I think you have to be uh, entrepreneurial about it. I used to run another magazine called Asians and Media, which I, I shut down now, um, just because I couldn't be asked to do it for too long. But, and that I earned money from recruitment advertising. I had a classified section, which I started up, uh, and then an events calendar so that people could uh, you know, post uh, events to it and charge 10 pounds a commercial event for that, not charity events, um, and general advertising. And I, I think it depends on your niche. So, for example, if you're if you're like a, I don't know, a real estate developer, then Google Ads are brilliant enough for you. If you're if you're doing politics, it's much more difficult. Uh, in actual fact, if you're doing a niche interest, it's much more easy for you because if you're trying to capture that audience, then. Um, then it's worthwhile. Like I had a friend, and I, I'm going to just throw this out there to you guys. I had a friend who used to do. Um, um, he still does, actually. He does a lot of uh, personal development. You know, like kind of self-help books and stuff like that. You know, you know, uh, ten ways to make your life better and stuff like that. And I said, there's no, there's no blog which really covers that as a news industry, and it'd be brilliant because you can make a ton of money if you, because you had a lot of people who advertise these big events with like Anthony Robbins and all these people who come over from the US and and I said it's really odd actually it'd be great if I mean as a money making venture purely as a money making venture you would just start up a blog which just covers this industry and if you've got enough of a, uh, a capture over that industry or enough people are reading it then you could charge a ton of money just from saying well if you want to advertise your event then pay us 200 pounds. Um, so, you know, that's a great, uh, it's a business idea for you guys. I, ha I haven't actually managed to get it off the ground because I just got too many other projects on the go. So if someone wants, out there wants to do it, then go do it. Um, with Liberal Conspiracy, it's been incredibly difficult because um, unlike the US, there's no, there's no, there's not lots, lots of money in political blogging uh, or there's not lots of organizations which spend a lot of money uh, in politics. So I have to rely on just normal ads for page impressions. And the Guardian have just recently started uh, uh, selling our ad space, um, and they're expanding out of that. You know, trying to just sell, sell their own ad space. And um, and I also use uh, so I write for other people. I do like uh, programming and stuff like that. And I also build up a brand name. So the aim is to try and build up your name as a commentator, and then you get invited to I don't know the BBC News or whatever it is, and you get paid for that. Uh, to do like, newspaper reviews and stuff. So y you've got to find lots of different ways and you've got to think Where is the angle here? I mean one of the things people used to say to me for Asians and media was why don't you do like these big? Um, because it become the, like the industry mag for people who worked in ethnic media as well as ethnic minorities in the national media people said why don't you do like a big um, 
uh, ev- uh, um, like an awards dinner, and awards dinner are, are amazingly uh, lucrative. And I, w- I did actually think about this seriously for a while to make some money, but I just can't be asked too much work involved. But the point is, there are lots, lots of ways. It, you know, there's just you can try and think, okay, if I'm doing this, there's got to be some sort of a side interest. Like, say, for example, if I had more time, I'd do lots more events. Uh, you know, political events where p- people come and pay like a fiver or something and they hear a debate on something, you know, and some people do do that. I think Westminster Skeptics organise these events and they charge like three pounds or four pounds donations on the door to do events. But you can't, you know, you can just try and think of how do you make money in different ways. I, I chose Liberal Conspiracy because uh, it was a an ironic um, sort of uh, tag. It was it was to say that you know, people on the right always think that there is a, a big liberal conspiracy in the UK uh, against them. These liberal elites are always sort of taking over and acting against them. Uh, the Melanie Phillips sort of um, caricature. And we thought, well, if there isn't one, because we think there isn't one, let's set up a liberal conspiracy. Um, what I didn't think about, actually, at the time, because I was much more interested in the US politics than UK politics, was that people misconstrued liberal and they thought I meant Lib Dem and that was the big disadvantage because all the Lib Dems suddenly turned up and said oh you're not a Lib Dem why are you calling yourself liberal conspiracy and I was like it's just a brand name you know um, they didn't seem to get that and uh, obviously a lot of people in the Labour Party said I th- and still do think that I'm a Lib Dem uh, and so that kind of causes some problems. I think lefty conspiracy actually would have worked better, but whatever, you stuck with the brand name. The, the, that's, the, that's the advantage, which is if you have a good brand name that sticks in people's minds, then people are much more likely to think, um, you know, okay, I want to read a left-wing blog today, or I'm thinking, you know, what shall I read? And then suddenly your name comes into mind and just type it. So I think it's important to try and, that goes back to my earlier point, it's important to have a sort of a, 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 an ethos or some sort of a uh, a way to uh, package yourself so people think, oh, I want to read a left-wing blog, I want to see what the lefties are saying, so I'll go to Liberal Conspiracy, Labour List, Left Foot Forward, there's three or four big blogs, um, you know, or if I want to read what the right-wingers are saying, I'll go to Conservative Home, Guido Fawkes, um, um, The Spectator magazine. So you try and, you want to have a name so that people will also think of you when they uh, I'm thinking, you know, I want to see what else is out there and what else people are saying. Good question. And, and, and this is what happens actually. People remember something that you've written about three years ago or four years ago. I mean, actually, the Lib Dem thing was last year. But I remember being hounded for stuff which I've said like four years ago. I was like, Jesus, I changed my mind, so what? You know, but um, people don't seem to uh, like that. But I, I think it's a, it's, you should you should explain why you know you change your mind. So I was a Lib Dem. I, I voted Lib Dem last year, and then I thought th- th- this uh, the, the coalition what they did was an incredibly bad idea. I could never go back to Lib Dem, so I joined the Labour Party. And there was lots of convoluted thinking that I had to explain to people and say this is why I did it because it's. I think it's, I, I I didn't think it was that uh, difficult to explain, but people are very tribal when it comes to politics. So. Um, So yeah, I mean, you really have to, I I would really suggest thinking carefully about uh, publishing and thinking, is this going to come and bite me in the ass later on? Because it sometimes will, if people read your stuff and they will point something out. And it's so easy these days to just Google something by domain or by person and just say, ah, I caught you. So I just, I openly admit that, you know, sometimes you change your mind over stuff. So I have changed my mind over uh, uh, on some issues, uh, I'm trying to think of a big one, but I can't. But, you know, it happens. No, no, completely, and I don't uh, say that I'm neutral, ever. I, but I do think that you could try and temper your language in a way that doesn't come across as like you're just frothing at the mouth, just being really angry uh, uh, you know, at, at the Conservatives or what they're doing. And, and so, you know, sometimes you just say, um, I mean, I, I think neutrality, even in the national, even in national media, is a bit of a fig leaf, to be honest. I mean, there's a good, uh, there's a good debate uh, started by uh, Jay Rosen in the US, uh, you, you mentioned him earlier, and he has this thing about what the, like, what, what's it called? The, that's it, the view from nowhere, which is basically this idea that he said, she said kind of journalism. That really annoys the hell out of me because sometimes uh, politicians will just lie 
and it's rare that a newspaper turns around and said, actually, this is false. And I remember just, um, actually, Jay Rosen recently highlighted a, a New York Times article, which is also one of my bugbears by the NY Times, is that they actually said, someone said this, and they said, this is false. And that's so rare to see for, for any outlet. I mean, I had this argument with someone from The Independent when um, they quoted a Lib Dem, uh, sorry, a Tory MP, Nadine Dorries, complaining that the, the trade unions were trying to ban high heels at work, which was completely untrue. All they said was high heels um, uh, you know, cause problems uh, for women who don't want to wear them. I mean, that some, that some uh, workplaces force women to wear high heels. And, and I said that you've just quoted her without actually pointing out this is false. And they said, well, we've quoted her because that's what she said. And then there's a quote from someone else pointing out this, uh, something else. But I said, but it, it doesn't actually explain the situation, which is that it's actually just untrue. So for that reason, I think a lot of uh, this idea that uh, national uh, that uh, newspaper journalism is balanced because or, or neutral because they're reflecting two opposing sides, I don't buy into that. So I just say, look, I'm from the left. Uh, you take the take the story, take it or leave it. And sometimes it that story might be, um, like I said, you know, BBC has an internal policy. This is what someone has said, and you take it at its face value and say. Yes, I'm going to take that seriously, or I'm not, and then people can judge that on the basis of I don't know, um, you know, how much credibility does this person have? I mean, recently we published a story, an FOI request story about how the government's fund for funding um, small businesses had actually not handed out any money whatsoever after 18 months, and that story got picked up by the Guardian and the Independent. That was a straight FOI story. I mean, obviously, we had made fun of Eric Pickles, who had said this is going to be a new big growth strategy. Um, but the story was a story. It was a straight FOI request that they had, their department had come back to us and said, oh, yeah, we haven't handed out any money. And, and it became a story. So I, I don't think it always works against you if you have come from a political standpoint, as long as the story can still stand up. Sometimes it is, and I would be perfectly honest. I think that uh, our aim is to try and say that um, if you want to know, not always, but if you want to see what the left is saying or what's going on across everywhere else, then this is what, and, and actually I will just some, sometimes pick two, three paragraphs from the Telegraph and quote them and say, hey, read the full story at the Telegraph, because what people want to do is they want to discuss it at Liberal Conspiracy. So in so what you're doing is you're doing a uh, you have a range of content. So you have opinion, you have uh, new stuff, and you have aggregation, like the Huffington Post, which is brilliant at this, which is just linked to lots of different stuff. So you almost go to it because you want to say, oh, okay, I go to the Huffington Post and I see what else is going on elsewhere, and then from there on you can go to other places. So we have like you know top stories in the new in the national media across the blogs. This is what's going on. I think it's important if you're setting yourself up as an aggregator to try and be the aggregator enough to sort of say, you know, okay, I am regurgitating some of the stuff that other people are saying, but you can discuss it at my blog, you know, because in one sense people have built up a community there and they want to, they want someone to discuss it. They don't want to end up, you know, arguing with uh, people who hang out at the Telegraph website. No offense to anyone who hangs out at the Telegraph website, but but the point is that. Um, there's nothing wrong with it. You know, you, you try and sometimes you regurgitate, sometimes you have a new opinion. If, if you're clear about the fact that you are simply regurgitating, and I will say, you know, this story has got from a press release, and I will say that, you know, because I want to be open about the fact that I've got a press release which says this, and here it is, and then you can discuss it and then, or dismiss it at your own leisure. I mean, it, it could go on for years. I mean, Andrew Sullivan, for example, who is a big US blogger, has been, he's moved around so many times uh, and is now at the Daily Beast. And he's been blogging for, I think, a good 10 years. Um, more than that, probably. And I've been blogging for six years, but I keep on blogging in lots of different spaces. So I, I think that um, it really depends if you, um, I mean, at the end of the day, it's your it's your work, and if you suddenly feel like, oh, you know what, I don't really want to do this anymore, it's kind of like a chore, 
and it I, I'm no longer interested in this I mean my previous thing Asians in media was um, uh, sort of a, a magazine but also after a while I was like I'm sick of writing stories about the media and so I just stopped it and so you, you kind of just when you get bored of it I'd say you know stop don't force yourself into doing something that you're not interested in doing oh god I don't give them any freedom whatsoever I mean seriously it's dangerous to give uh, other bloggers freedom uh, and I, and I used to be a lot more um, open about this and then, then obviously I got hit by a, a, a libel uh, letter and I was like, okay. And then other times people have posted something completely uh, too quick off the mark. I mean, a good example was a story that someone published on uh, Julian Assange in WikiLeaks. And so they'd published about the rape allegations before people had known what the rape allegations were. They'd come out. and. And so he published a story which was kind of uh, playing down those allegations, which I would not have done. I, w I would not have published. I would have said, no, you, you can't you know, play these allegations down um, until they've been made public. Anyway, I was out of the country at the time, and unfortunately he published this. And I couldn't pull it. I mean, it got, had like 400 retweets by the time I came back to it. And um, so I was like, well, what can I do now? But but now there's only one or two people who actually have uh, access to publish directly to the blog because uh, people don't people sometimes don't think that you know if you're posting something about a person or an organisation you can quite easily be hit with a, uh, with a libel uh, letter um, which is my big worry um, or that people find it really offensive because this happens a lot in politics you know someone's like you know whatever political correctness you know, forget political correctness, I'm going to say this is a pile of crap. And if someone else says, oh my God, you've just been offend, you know, offensive, and then a big row breaks out. Um, and so you want to avoid that too. So I, I try and, um, everything is sent to me, and then I publish it after looking at it uh, for legal reasons. Or actually, it's not even for legal reasons. People write too much. This is my biggest issue, is that people send me an article which could be summarized in 300 words and they send me 1,000 words. And I'm like, this is just too long. And so one of the things I would always say when you're blogging is try and cut it down as much as possible. Um, like literally three, 400 words. I mean, now we have a limit of like 500 on average. And if it's anything long than, longer than 500 words, then, then you're going on too long. And, or you put subheadings in to try and cut it down. But it, your blog should be able to, it should be summarized in 500 words. Otherwise, you know, there is, there are websites out there which do long form blogging, but I, I think that generally it's a, it's a bad idea. So most of the time, my editing requires just cutting stuff down. People are saying, this is too long. I'm just going to cut it and then I'm going to publish it. And you can complain about the fact that I've ch taken out vast chunks of your prose, you know, in the comments, basically. And that's what they do mostly. So, well, I mean, it's incredibly difficult because you have people, and I see some people on the left who are within the Lib Dems, and some people who are Greens who hate the Labour Party, and and some people who hate all political parties. So, um, it's a it's a, it's a challenge. Uh, we've had lots of fights about it on in comments uh, in the in the comment section. Um, I just try and pick good writers who've got something interesting to say, and even if they say something provocative, uh, you know, it's like, you know, we had one guy who was a legal blogger who posted about, for example, um, um, that the, the the sentence for Charlie Gilmore, you know, the guy who was the student who got arrested for swinging off the the remembrance thing, uh, and he said actually. If you look at the, the actual um, sentence, it, it was within the confines of what the law allows, so it was a perfectly reasonable sentence. And obviously that annoyed a lot of people, activists, who were a lot of our readers, um, who think that he should not have been given any sentence whatsoever, and then obviously a big row broke out. And I was like, well, look, the problem is a lot of left with a lot of lefties is they just hate, uh, and, and it's a big generalization, but it is... Uh, and I think I'm placed to make this, which is that they actually hate opinion which differs from them. And so, so you do get a lot of rows and a lot of people, you know, <coughs> tweeting at me and saying, I've stopped reading your blog. I'm like, well, fine, don't read the blog. You know, but at the end of the day, if you can't have a blog which has a, a broad range of opinion to reflect that the left is a broad place, then, then I think that um, you're not doing your job. 
and to that extent you have to have a thick skin um, and just you know if people uh, swear at you or whatever it's like you know and what well, you know it's, it's not it's not a big deal oh I, all the time like I, I go on other blogs a lot and comment I go on my own blog constantly and comment I swear at my own readers and my writers so you know you have to really um, I think be um, part of the system the ecosystem and so I, I don't think um, I mean sometimes it gets me into trouble but you know what the hell that's I, I really think if you're if you're blogging then you have to be prepared to get into trouble once in a while Yeah, no, I do. So they, they post straight away. I had a big debate with The Guardian, actually, about this, because The Guardian comment is free when they launched, was too free. And I said to them, the, the mistake that you made um, earlier on was that you allow a culture of just drive-by commenting, as I call it. And, and, and so if you have that culture, and actually I've, I've started off being, and I actually used the word militant, and I said I'm very militant when it comes to comments and so if you post something even vaguely uncivil then I will delete it uh, and so I started off from, from that and now I'm much more relaxed because the culture has developed to being much more uh, civil and um, and generally I don't think I have to delete comments I, I mean I think I delete one every hundred comments so it's not too bad but you have to you have to because I knew it was going to be a, a sort of when I started, I, I got lots of bloggers together, so it, and we had an article in the Guardian about it. So I knew immediately there were going to be lots of comments, and so I had to just make sure right from day one that it was uh, moderated quite strongly. If you're starting up a blog, um, if, you know, and then you're not expecting a, a rush of commenters on your blog, then you can still try and develop a culture. But I would actually say, you know, early on, just let anyone comment you what you want. One of the things I did with my first blog, when no one was had known of me, I at that time just put together a bunch of six, seven friends, and I said, "Look, we're all going to write for this blog." And then every day, as a, a blog post went up, I encouraged all of them to post comments, so even if we were just us lot discussing the stuff. It gave the impression that there were lots of people on the blog because you had five or six to ten comments or whatever it is. But it's it's a real it's a real network effect because if you have a blog which has comments on it already, then people will discuss much more willing to go in and start discussing comments and start discussing the articles. If you have a blog where no one is discussing anything and people feel that no one's talking about it, even if they want to, they will not discuss it because they feel like that no one's going to come back to it or no one's going to read it, so it's just going to end up being wasted as a comment. So they never get involved. And so always, always, when you're starting up a blog, try and get a bunch of friends together. And even if you're just talking amongst yourself, do it uh, to develop this sort of uh, a culture of go good discussion. And then I think then peop more people are w uh, g likely to come in and sort of discuss stuff with you. And then you build up a, an actual audience as opposed to just your mates. I'm explicit about the fact that the aim of the the blog is to reach out to the left and say look this is what we should be discussing or this is what's going on or this is so it's not too it's not a vote grabbing strategy so if I was a politician I'd say you know yeah I want to reach out to as many people as possible whereas if I'm uh, running Lib LibCon I sort of say no I don't really want to reach out to everyone I want to I have a constituency out there of people who are activists who do or academics or intellectuals or whatever it is and I want to influence them and then get them to go out and have those discussions so have an impact on their discussions and then they will go out and affect the general political environment um, but if you do want millions of people to read your blog then it's got to be news news is the only thing that will get people coming to your blog uh, news um, picking fights Paul said earlier but I don't just pick fights purely for the um, I mean, I don't always pick fights for the sake of picking fights, but sometimes I do. But there, for example, one of the things that we used to also do was you have to create a sense of like urgency, like there's something happening here, that something's going to break, some news. So for example, um, a couple of months back when there was a, a piece of legislation going through about reducing uh, on abortion, it was to, uh, bloody hell, I forgot it already, it was to do with uh, Nadine Dorries and what was the thing again? It was to, 
um, she lost the vote anyway I forget now one is to do with uh, oh yeah that was it counseling for women who seek an abortion and so we almost did this we did this thing that we we say well, we're gonna publish a whole bunch of articles around this person to expose what they're going to, what, what, what they've done in the past um, or what they've said in the past or what their real agenda is and stuff like that and so what it does is it creates a sense like you know the, the, a bit of danger that there, there could be something dangerous here for this politician and there was I mean we, we dug up lots of stuff some, some of it which had been published somewhere else but it, what it does is it creates a sense of like momentum that people that this blog is going to publish new new revelations every day and I think that drives a lot of uh, readers as well because people want to know uh, to do with the news agenda what's what's going to break what news is going to break what's happening um, is it going to cause any trouble to any politician or something like that and that really drives a lot of uh, readers as well so in that sense when you're publishing that stuff you're obviously trying to reach out to a broader constituency the media other politicians and stuff like that um, but that will come from you know, being able to break news. At the end of the day, we've only been able to um, build up our audience by doing a lot of news, basically. Just trying to find news articles and stuff like that.